Welcome, everyone. We're excited uh, excited to kick off today's session. Um, we have a webinar here uh, between Boston New Technology and DB Maestro. And we're really excited about this collaboration. Uh, we get to have Annie of Yehuda um, as our featured speaker for today. And it's an exciting topic for us, all of the tech community here at Boston New Tech um, in our global audience. and it's uh, today's session will be around, it's called Bridging the Divide, Integrating DevOps and Database Management. So at Boston New Technology, we run several different meetups and communities all under a brand that helps technologists really find and hone uh, all the resources they need in order to create successful innovation. So that can be entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship, um, really just building out the future of innovation. And this is an exciting topic for us. Uh, you know, we haven't, um, we've done other DevOps uh, events in the past, but, you know, um, had really, you know, got connected with uh, the team, and even Ben from DB Maestro and um, learned all about all the great resources they offer and, you know, excited uh, to present and, uh, you know, have the session today. It's going to be a workshop format to start. We're going to keep the chat interactive. So if you want to um, introduce yourself, share, you know, what you're working on, whether it's, uh, a, you know, development, uh, whether you're a developer for other companies, uh, you're working internally within an organization, you're a startup founder or entrepreneur, uh, we want to hear, you know, what brings you out, what you're excited to learn from as part of the session. Um, and yeah, we'll keep that chat interactive. And then we also have a Q&A tab if you have questions along the way. Um, so yeah, there'll be a presentation and then time for uh, direct questions from the audience. Um, for a little bit of context, we're, today we're gonna be going over how to accelerate deployments without sacrificing quality. Um, we're going to learn about intelligent database automation systems. We're also going to cover how to unify change management with different methods of modification across your development team, keeping everybody in line and on the same page with this single reliable source. We're going to go over integration and how you can manage your strategies for DevOps and database activities into a cohesive pipeline. Um, and then there's also several giveaways for a uh, five user license of DB Maestro's database source control offering, which um, has a value of $2,500. And then we have uh, two Amazon gift cards as well. Um, quick background on the speaker, uh, Yaniv is the founder and chief product officer at DB Maestro. Uh, which is an enterprise software company focusing on DevOps for databases. And over the last decade, he's been promoting modernization of database processes and has helped countless companies improve database workflows and technology stacks. And with that, excited to have you introduce yourself as well and um, share and kick off our presentation today. Thanks, Jason. Pleasure being uh, with you today here. Uh, as I said, my the name is. Audio uh, can, you hear me well? can you hear me well? You hear me now? Oh, perfect. It seems that Jason doesn't hear me. Um, let's see. Yeah, it worked well backstage. Um, Jason, it, it seems that uh, they can hear me based on the chat, so I'll, I'll you continue. You see there's a... Oh, they can. Yeah. All good. <laughs> so, uh, as you, as Jason said, my name is Yaniv. I'm the founder of, of the Maestro. Let me share my screen here and start uh, going through it. Uh, as the founder of the Maestro, essentially, uh, Part of my role is uh, leading uh, the product and leading the product in, in, in a DevOps uh, arena essentially means that I 
I have a chance to talk to a lot of companies, a lot of uh, uh, different uh, challenges, see how people are struggling, what works and what is not working so much. And uh, this is part of what I wanted to share with you today. But I would want to start from actually the beginning or the very beginning. So essentially, development as a whole is, is a new science, okay? It's been around for just a few decades. So if you compare that to maybe a building and, and, and uh, building homes and apartments and buildings, uh, that is a very exact science. You can know how you start and how you proceed and, and where, what, what are the correct ingredients and, and, and rules for everything that you want to do. Uh, software is not there. Software is completely uh, uh, being revolutionized every uh, uh, a few years or a decade. And it's 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 something in 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 progress and and being formulated. Of course, if we're taking AI in, into the mix with the recent uh, changes, so let's try to understand where we're coming from. So uh, I'm not sure how many of you heard about uh, like uh, waterfall development and agile, of course, but DevOps and DevSecOps. So how did we actually move from one to the other? We started by uh, creating a process that was the first like maybe a structured way to do uh, application development. We started by uh, making sure that we uh, talk to the customer, uh, understand what their uh, requirements are, uh, build some kind of a design and maybe even get that approved by the customer and then go to our offices or our homes and, and, and work for sometimes half a year, a year, year and a half and go, then go back to the customer and saying, voila, we're done. Uh, see what a beautiful, amazing stuff we've built here. But the problem is that the time that passed from the, that conversation with the customer to the point where you show him something or them something is very long. And you invested tons of efforts in, in, in that period. And if you got something wrong, if you misunderstood the customer, if the customer misunderstood what he wanted, if he said exactly what he wanted, but you did uh, like understood it differently, or you understood exactly what he meant and, and somewhere along the, the line, it got like transformed into something different. You might have invested uh, uh, years of man hours uh, into that only to realize that that project would not be able to move forward. And if I remember correctly, the, the, the numbers that people were talking these days, like 80, 90% of the projects were failing Okay, altogether, because the process is rigid, it's not working, you don't get uh, the, the correct feedback, and, and many times you provide something that is not working, or because the process was so long, it was working based on assumptions of a year and a half or two years ago, and things have changed, and it's not, not longer the, 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 the things that, that you're trying to solve. So that was a big problem. Now... People try to fix that. They invented all kinds of processes, spiral model and, and rapid uh, application development and, and uh, unified processes and, and many other things that were improving on that uh, process until we came up with agile development. Okay, so extreme development and then agile development. And essentially, the goal of, of agile is very simple. Get feedback. Uh, you want to make sure that you focus on short intervals so you can get constant feedback from your customer. The goal is of, of sprints is to have something that you can uh, show, something that you can uh, 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 demonstrate. And, and, and while you do that, you get consistent feedback from uh, the customer, the team leads, the, the product manager, everybody. And that gave uh, uh, development constant fine tuning of the process. So we were able to uh, uh, improve the process. We were delivering smaller packages each, each sprint. So it became easier to test them. And overall, uh, because we were fine tuning uh, uh, the process all the time, customer was able to get, give us feedback and the end result made sense. So it was a much higher success rate than, than working in, in Waterfall. But what happened is that Agile was a development process. And when you actually try to take that process to uh, production, think of a bank. Okay, so the, the, the Agile development team can produce a, a new version 
uh, every two weeks. The bank was used to do a heavy release every year and release meant like two months of getting ready and, and, and testing on our a, on a internal, uh, uh, maybe uh, sim a simulated branch and, and maybe going to the first uh, uh, like branch that is used to new revisions before that you go out publicly to all the branches. So it like didn't scale. So development was working very fast, issuing releases over releases and releases and, and more stuff. And, and, and they were able to, to do great things. But then you just hit the wall when you went wanted to go to production, and that may made uh, that made sure that you couldn't get the feedback because it didn't get to the customer, it didn't get to the user. So on one side we're talking about something very frequent that is conflicting with something that is not used to that frequency, can't deal with it, is not ready for it, and 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 can't deal with the process itself. So we got stuck uh, going to production, and then of course. This is the whole goal of DevOps. So I, I personally call DevOps taking Agile to production. So you could uh, like connect the process that works great for development and implement it into the production processes. So you could accelerate uh, the deployment processes. So if you used to have a release every six months, now you could do it with uh, automation processes every uh, two weeks or a day or five minutes and uh, improve the overall process because you keep getting this feedback, but now you deliver smaller packages, smaller incrementals, so there's less risk about every uh, uh, a change. You're not shipping out huge things. You might ship huge things, but you break it up to pieces of deliverable pieces, and that means the, the, the risk is lower. But that also means that you have to have a very good process to deliver it because you are talking about high-frequency releases. Now, uh, this is, as I said, this is something that is being constantly improved. So talking today, we're not talking about just DevOps, but DevSecOps, meaning security is now uh, being poured into the mix and as early as possible, as early as development or first initial feedback. Because again, we don't want to complete uh, something and then realize, yeah, we should have thought about this or that, and, and this is risky from security perspective. So we want security, uh, both guys and tools and processes and reviews done as early as possible. So that becomes DevSecOps, and that you like the, the, call it the enterprise view of uh, DevOps. So this is how we got to where we are today. And I wanna zoom out and talk about what has been happening like while all of, of, of this story has been uh, unveiling. So uh, I wanna talk about DORA. Uh, essentially DORA, uh, uh, DevOps Research and Assessment uh, was born like 15 years ago. Uh, they were issuing surveys each year, annual surveys, about what's happening in the industry, who's doing what, what is working, what is not working. Because as I said, again, this is something that is maturing and we, we want that feedback. We want to understand what's like how the market is working. By the way, five years ago, about five years ago, I think uh, uh, Google bought them and, and, and sponsored all of their operations. So since that, that became like the, the best practice or the, let's call it the, the blueprint to how you actually do uh, uh, DevOps and, and measure it. So in these uh, uh, reports, and, and I'll speak specifically about the latest one of 2023 one, uh, Google spread it out to more than 30,000 uh, uh, companies and, and asked uh, uh, 30 or 29 questions. And essentially, they wanted to do to understand what's happening, who's doing what, wherever they could get the feedback. And out of it, they got like four KPIs that stood up. These four KPIs essentially helped companies understand what's happening. So uh, based on your uh, deployment frequency, how quickly can you deploy uh, uh, your, your code? Uh, your change lead time from the moment developer is sitting down to deal with the feature till it's in production. This is lead time. Uh, how much time does it take? Less than a day, maybe two weeks, maybe three months. Uh, you know, everything is valid. Question is where you are on that uh, scale. How many of your changes are failing? And if something fails, how quickly can you solve it? So based on, on, on these four KPIs, which they saw like the most uh, 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 correlation between the, the KPIs and the success of the company and its ability 
to be mature and be able to, uh, uh, to, to be productive and effective, they came up with uh, the factors of, uh, that you can see here on, on the slides. Like if you do, uh, if it takes you uh, less than a day to release a change, and if it takes you less than an hour to fix, etc., you might be in the in the elite uh, side. And if you're actually, it takes you a few months to issue something, and more than half of it are of your changes are failing, it takes you more than a half uh, than a month to fix it, then you're in a very bad place. So. The goal is to get some objective comparison. This is the great thing that, that, that Dora brought to the market, the ability to understand what's happening. And, and you can see like where companies are rated. It's not that everybody is our, our elites or everybody even our, our, our medium. So you could see how this is spreading. And the goal, obviously, for each company is to understand this for themselves in order to understand where they need to, uh, to be better and, and, and improve. So this is all done uh, through analyzing these four uh, KPIs. So as I mentioned, uh, deployment frequency, lead time, change, failure rate, and time to uh, restore service. The goal uh, is this, but uh, what's happening is that in the market itself, and this is a, a, recent, uh, re a recent piece of information that, that I just uh, uh, got, uh essentially the market itself is accelerating so if you're looking at uh, projects that have been uh, implementing uh, devops if you're looking at the last five years we moved from 45 percent to to 80 percent of the projects that are actually implementing devops as part of their operation and the goal is obvious so if you're trying to be better what are you trying to do you're trying to reduce time to market to be quicker to, to make sure that people are collaborating well, that your your uh, quality is going up because you can test everything better, you're more agile, you're, you're, you're utilizing resources and, and, and that saves costs. So essentially uh, DevOps is no longer uh, like a hype. Uh, like years, a few years ago, it was still debated yeah, if this is like the answer or the, the, the current hype because we did see that there were all kinds of, of ways to, to, to do that. But essentially, uh, people came up with the understanding that this is the way to go forward. And the way to take it forward is to use tools because we cannot uh, uh, have automated deployments that do a few releases a day if we don't have something that tests these changes and actually releases them and documents what's happening and puts everything in source control so we can understand what's happening. So in order to have a proper DevOps, we could have like a manual process doing all of this, but you can't get to the scale, you can't get to the frequency, you can maybe follow the best practices of behavioral uh, 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 processes, but not more than that. So in order to implement these processes, obviously you need tools. The problem, starts when you realize that there's a lot of tools for the uh, application side of things and people are getting ahead uh, of, of the, 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 the DevOps curve versus the database side of things where too many, two thirds are saying that there's no automation, okay? Nobody has full automation on, this is a DB master survey like uh, six months ago. Uh, most of the ones starting are having some partial kind of automation, but but it's it's they're not happy with where they are. So this is exactly uh, uh, the challenge that I'm going to talk about today. Why is this gap exist? Why it's easy for application, it's challenging for the database. Why is it even different? Let's start from why it, is it really different. So the database, unlike a piece of code, unlike even a compiled code that you might self save in in a binary repository. The database is different by definition. It's not a single file. Uh, like, uh, it's, I'm sorry, it is a single file. So a database might manifest itself on the operation system with a terabyte size of a, of a single file. So you cannot save it in source control and keep copy of, copies of it because in seconds you'll consume all your storage and you wouldn't be able to manage versions. And if you want to release a version, you cannot copy your database from one environment to the other because you would break and overwrite all your existing content, which is your crown jewel, you know, your data. So changes need to be delivered incrementally. You 
you release uh, the, the changes that change the existing database. And hence, we're having a, a few more objects to manage. It's not just, here's the latest copy. It's the copy. How do I upgrade? How do I downgrade? What are the dependencies? Because there's many uh, consistent, uh, uh, like, challenges in addition to, to every change that I make. And the tools that deal with application code are not designed to deal with that problem. And most of them usually try not to deal with it. But the problem is that between 10% to 40% of the application code is database. Let's say 20% just for the ease of the discussion. Of course, it's depending on the applications. There's applications that have no database, usually maybe run uh, like real-time uh, uh, applications and stuff that doesn't deal with databases. And there are applications that would, might be 60 or 70% database. But the um, like general agreement is that between 10 and 40% or 20 in average uh, uh, of the application code would be database application. And here's the problem. Uh, the solutions today in the market are dealing with the code, but I, I, I had uh, the opportunity to talk to many uh, uh, different companies offering CI CD solutions. Usually when they talk to the customer, they, they say, yeah, we can do the database as well. Let's let's discuss this later. Let's create another meeting and just run away and hide. We hope they can get away with, with without that discussion. And essentially the database would be handled later, which means many times never. And that is of course a problem because if you think about it, like, uh, like let's talk about an enterprise. An enterprise would have hundreds of applications and a few environments, you know, a dev, test, maybe UAT in production, and have many changes and many teams in many locations. And essentially, you need to manage all of this. And if you have a great process for your application side of things, for your .NET or Java, or whatever code, Python code, and you have to deal with the same complexity on the database side of things, it's a challenge. And then, uh, uh, you start realizing that that challenge actually falls on somebody's lap. And, and just think about, you know, having a release in the weekend, you know, the one that nobody wants to go to that party where you meet on Friday night or, or Saturday night, even worse, and start releasing uh, only to figure out that there's a problem. And of course, what would you do? So uh, it's a challenge to maybe use uh, tools that are not, uh, meant for to dealing with database, so to move faster, or maybe say, well, let's let's do it slower because it's risky because the data is is so hard to manage and 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 the complexity and the risk is high. Let's do it manually and make sure that we're doing we know what we're doing. So, what would you do? Would you move slower or faster? You know, move slower to save uh, save save you from the risk of breaking the database, or move faster because you have to because this is what is required of you. And as it turned out, you know, moving slower does not prevent you from making the mistakes. You know, just think about this funny slide here about doing a delete without a where, and that works perfectly in dev where you deleted five rows, but two million rows in, in production because you forgot to put the where. And this is just a simple example that moving slow doesn't prove or, 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 or promise anything. And if you think about automation, all of these companies are using automation, but still, you know, uh, a 99.995 uptime, it means you might be down for an hour. An hour for, for, for McDonald's is not say, not selling $100 million of, of, of products or, or for Knight Capital that issued a, a, a piece of code that conflicted with another server uh, they, they were doing like automated trading. Uh, and and that two misaligned pieces of code uh, in, in the database started like a cycle of, of doing uh, automated trading in, in, in cycles nonstop for 45 minutes. And they lost essentially the company. They went bankrupt after an hour. So the company was actually purchased a few months later, but that damage was created in 45 minutes. So moving fast doesn't prove anything if you're not dealing with everything that you need to do. So what are you doing? If you're moving fast and breaking things and if you're moving slow and, and breaking things, 
you need to focus on stop breaking things. You need to manage risk. And this is what it means to, to move fast, but deploy with quality. So yes, you need to create the automated process, but you have to put the guardrails in place. If you're moving fast for the sake of speed, I think it was uh, Zuckerberg who said, you know, uh, if you're not breaking things, you're not moving fast enough. Yes, but nobody wants to break the database, okay? So let's focus uh, on, on the database. Let's start by realizing like, uh, what do we do? So uh, who, who exactly is writing the code? This is even not something that is uh, unified across different uh, companies. In some companies, you might have uh, developers on one side, DBAs on another, they're not talking to each other. There's a silo. Uh, so different silos, everybody's working on their thing. Uh, who writes the code? Is it developers who write the code and they send it to DBAs that try to, to make sure it works right or proof it or improve it? Or do the DBAs write the code for the developers because they're the experts, they know how to do it and more efficiently, etc. Who's reviewing it? How, how do you optimize the process? How do you make sure that if you have a big team of developers, and usually a much smaller team of, of, of DBAs, you don't like create a, a problem of, 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 of scale and, and a bottleneck. So every time the developer is doing something, does he need to get the uh, review from the DBA? The DBA becomes the bottleneck. So there's a problem here, okay? So we need to understand that. And with the same process, again, everybody's speeding up. We saw that graph, like we went from in five years from 45% to 80% implementation of DevOps processes. So we cannot stay in the same place. We cannot live with manual processes for the database. And that's the whole point I wanna uh, uh, discuss today. So uh, this is from a couple of years ago. We had a survey that uh, uh, touched an amazing point. People were trying to do, uh, uh, to go to that uh, uh, process of uh, that I showed you through Dora, where if you issue the uh, releases quickly enough, you have smaller releases and the chance for quality is going up because everything is like more uh, segmented and, and more focused. But they found out it's the act, uh, the opposite uh, has resulted. So the more the more releases they had, the more issues they had. And if you think about it. And, and, and we did, we did, we drilled down into that data. We found out that they were all using either uh, uh, semi-manual processes or uh, incompatible tools, and they didn't have the, the checks and balances in place. They didn't have the process to, to prevent them from making database specific errors, like the ones that you see on the screen here, and I'll talk about it. Uh, it was not in place. They were focusing on the frequency rather than on the control. And it's like, just think about, you know, a, a sports car going very fast, like it accelerates like crazy, but uh, you don't have brakes and your windshield is, is opaque. You don't see what's coming. You're going to hit that wall. You're going to drive uh, off the road at some point. That's, that's for sure. And that was uh, uh, what people were seeing in that older uh, survey. So we tried to understand like what was the problem and, 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 and came up with a list of these uh, uh, issues that they came up with and, 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 and broke their releases on. So for like one specific thing I wanna talk about is a configuration drift. This is a problem unique to the database, unlike software, where if you have like the latest uh, uh, release and you compile it and you have your uh, all, exec all your executable executables, and you maybe even save it in in, uh, 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 in a binary repository, and, and you're really working well. When you deploy it, you deploy it; it moves. So unless you broke the, the server itself and its configuration, the application would work as tested. But for the database, because each database held the full configuration, that means that sometimes the configuration itself was not right and was not identical between different environment. So you had something testing in development. Well, perfect. You know, like it, it works on my station as a developer, but you move to test and it worked and you move to uh, UAT and it worked uh, and you move to production and it failed because you are were not aware that on production you had more data and now you had different indexes and that conflicted somehow and the whole thing just collapsed because 
you did not test it in a consistent way. Okay, so consistency of configuration between environments is a problem much more, uh, uh, it, this is a, a problem much more uh, uh, relevant to databases in comparison to uh, application code. Accidental overrides, because you're not managing everything in your Git or you don't have a, a proper process to, uh, to document what you did, you might issue a release that would break somebody else's release in team conflicts, because again, you're not using source control. So there's a lot of issues here that uh, essentially created the situation that you're failing because you're not using the correct tools and the correct process. So what would you do? How would you solve this process? How would you move faster, but deploy with quality? So let's move from theory to practice and, and look at the checklists of uh, how we should actually do that. First of all, uh, we should uh, implement the best practices that have matured in the last five, six, seven years. DevOps, Agile development, it's proven. Let's do the exact same for the database. So if the problem is tooling, let's deal with the tooling to deal with the, 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 the implement, help us implement the process that is already working for us on the application side of things. That means none of you, and I could write to me in the chat if you, if, if you think differently, none of you uh, are doing development without a proper version control solution or source control solution. Most of you are probably using, I'm oh, sorry, most of you are probably using uh, Git. That's the standard de facto today. And, and that means that even if you have a homegrown solution, something that you play with at home, most likely you would, you would manage this in Git. For the database, most companies even do, do, don't do that. Okay, so that's a problem. And uh, how do we create a repeatable process? So we have a change. How do we make sure that if we do that manually, uh, for sure, you know, as a person, you could do the same thing again and again, but you do it 100 times, you're not going to do that exactly the same 100 times. So you are creating variations on your process, which is, of course, a risk to, to the overall end goal of, of becoming repeatable and, 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 and more successful. How do you balance workload? We talked about developers shipping out a lot of code. If they ship the code even faster, how would database people be able to deal with that? So we're creating more bottlenecks. So the goal is to just make sure that we are balancing uh, the workload. We're creating the, the, the process, the due process to deal with it like we're doing for the application code. And, 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 and to introduce the testing that we do. So don't test the, the, the application without dealing with the, the, the database use cases and make sure that you document everything as part of the automation. Because if you're implementing automation, one of the great things is you get automated documentation of everything that happened. You release that version to that server, that's written somewhere in most cases. So if not, it's very easy. To, to add that documentation to the automation. And from that moment on, it's documented everywhere. So if you do that change without a, 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 an automated process, sometimes you might document it. Sometimes you would forget. If it's 4 a.m., I'll show you deal with that on Monday. But Monday brings other challenges, and you probably won't. So first goal is to make sure that we take all the processes that we have in the, our application side of things and implement them in the database side of things. Let's talk about, again, go back to uh, the database uh, 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 differences from, from So uh, today for application, uh, we're just taking a piece of code, we're compiling it. If it's like a code that runs uh, uh, through an interpreter, like uh, all kinds of, of uh, web server things and, and stuff or, or, or Python code, we just ship the, the resources, the end resource. It might be compiled code, it might be code, but we move it. For the database, we issue uh, incremental changes. So if you have a table and it had four columns and now it has five, you're not putting the five columns on top of the four, you're adding a column. So it's incremental changes versus copy and replace. We need to understand it's not the same process. And uh, when we talk about application and, and the DevOps best practices says repeatability. You build the code only once and you deploy it many times in the same way. So just think about the challenge of you doing a compilation on a server 
and it has all kinds of libraries and DLLs and whatnots and versions of, of applications that is there. And 90% of the times you're building off that server and 10% you're building on another server that might be a slightly different configuration. And suddenly one in 10, your application behaves differently because you're not aware that you have a different version of, of uh, a compiled code or, or libraries in that second server. So you always build once, always build the same way. And if you build the same way, you get the same results. And then you deploy the same way and the same process to all the environments. So now we're talking about repeatability. And that repeatability is the key to making sure that uh, uh, you, you're creating the code in one way, you're testing it one way, you're deploying it one way. And then when you actually have that process laid out in, in such a way, when you move from, from uh, testing to UAT to pre-production and production, you tested four times that, not just the, the end result, but the transition process. So that's tested as well. And talking about transition process, database has two like ways to do things. Uh, State-based deployment and migration-based deployment. State-based is something that was born like as a necessity 15, 20 years ago, uh, where we had uh, applications looking at the different databases. I told you that like one of the biggest problems is uh, inconsistencies with uh, configuration. So uh, you might had uh, one server with uh, uh, five columns, one server with six columns, one server with this copy of your uh, uh, procedure and one server with that copy of your procedure. So a state base could say, okay, compare these two. Tell me where are the differences, which is an amazing tool. But the next required step was, okay, if you find a, a gap, give me the code to reconcile the gap. So uh, if I'm moving from, uh, uh, if I, I have in dev five columns and in uh, QA six columns, uh, you need to drop a column, okay? Because dev should be allegedly the more updated one. But what happened if uh, another team added that column? So you're in dev, you're not updated, Another team added the sixth column, you're about to deploy it. And, and to, 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 you compare it, you see it's like redundant, it's not on your dev. Now you're dropping it from dev. You just built, you, you just like broke somebody else's work. So, yes, the promise was great, but so is the risk because this is something that you need to, to, to monitor. This is something that you need to look at and say, okay, it's different, but this copy is correct. No, it's different, but that copy is correct. So, it's a great process, but it's, it cannot be automated, okay? Migration-based uh, deployments means you get the script. That script, you would always deploy in the same way. So if it says add a column, you don't have to think, wait, is it six or five? Where is the change coming from? The command is add a column. So this is how you create it. So in essence, uh, let me just... See here. Okay, I'm I'm getting a bit ahead ahead of myself, but I'll I'll visit the next slides in in a minute. So, uh, the process, the problem with each problem with each, each process is that if you talk about uh, a state base, the process is not repeatable. It means it creates it creates the code very easily, but as I said, if if now uh, um, you find something different in production. Is it production that is more updated or is it uh, your, your release? So it's it's not clear. If you're talking about the script that add column, it would always run the, the same way. But what happens if, again, we're getting to production and production is different and now it has a different configuration and that script would fail. So the consistency of the script hitting a, a, a a drifted environment, an environment that does not hold what you're expecting is still a risk. So two methods, each with, with its own challenge. So the problem is that you need to actually deal with both processes. So uh, you need to create the code once. So you might use uh, a state base, let's say from moving from development to uh, integration or testing that would see that development has uh, uh, something, it changed, but you know 
that in the previous version, it was not there, so you know you added. So it's okay to say state base can be used as long as it's connected to, to like the history of things. It's okay to use it to generate the code. But once you generate it, your code, your, your alter table add column becomes an immutable package. This is the only thing that will move forward. It would not be changed. So it, it's not like you deploy it to one environment, then you change it and deploy it differently to another because you want to have that consistency of a tested process. But now, in addition to having like the, the immutable script that is consistent, you're going to test each environment with a state-based process to assure it's not drifted. So yes, it's going to deploy to the next environment as long as it has what you're expecting. And this way, you're able to know in advance if you're going to hit a, a problem, if you're going to hit a change, something you're not expecting. Because nobody wants to deploy, to come in Saturday night, do the deployment, see that whatever worked for a, a, a few days well in the lab in, in all the previous environments, failing on production and start making phone calls at Friday or night or, 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 or Saturday night, even worse. Okay, So you can do that in advance. So to know about any drifts, to know about every problem, uh, if you actually take all of these uh, processes and combine them together. So this is a method. Uh, let's talk about uh, uh, the best practices that, that I just mentioned. So um, build once, deploy many, many times. That's the best practice. You make sure that the code is consistent and you deploy it the same way. Uh, once you deploy it, you want to deploy it with the two methods in sync. So sometimes you want to generate the code on the lower environments to save time. Getting code automated, great way. It just saves you development time and consistency. You make sure that you don't forget anything. But then you use migration to deploy it to all the, all the environments in the same way. Uh, you make sure that it doesn't change when moving between different environments. And you add the drift management to make sure that uh, you're also hitting a consistent environment. Uh, you also need to uh, make sure that your testing is part of that process. So uh, if that's unit testing, if that's uh, regression testing, whatever, and that everything is also documented. Uh, another way to make sure that we're managing uh, risk is to add a process to our CI processes. So CI continuous integration is whatever happens uh, before you actually deploy something. So let's say my developer, uh, she had made some changes. Uh, if we can just after she made a change to provide some initial tests and initial feedback and, and get that feedback back to that development, uh, we would be in a great place because she is still fresh with everything that he did, she did. And that means that uh, if something is failing, if you do a test of the release and it's not working, if you need to uh, uh, fine tune the code, if you have something that is not uh, uh, according to company policies, that would be the perfect time to fix it. Not two, three weeks later when she or he would move on to the next tax and have to phase in and phase out into uh, uh, that test because they would not be uh, uh, fresh with it. They would lose time. The company would lose money. And again, this is counter uh, uh, productive and the cost of rework. This is how it's, it's, it's tagged. The cost of rework keeps coming up and up. And, and of course, this is something that we want to uh, manage. So CI processes for the database could save you a lot of uh, time. Just issue these uh, changes to a database that you spin up for these tests, and, and that would most likely solve most of the problems. Uh, I talked about DevSecOps, so let's talk about security. Uh, the sooner we deal with that, the better the whole process is, and we want to make sure that we control the changes and type of changes that are made. So uh, is it okay that uh, uh, you actually drop a table? Is it company policy maybe to do a rename without uh, instead of a, a drop? Uh, is it okay to do a, a, a grant access? Uh, we just uh, I had a, a customer that for them uh, the only uh, person entitled entitled to, to 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 do grants to provide permissions to database objects are security guys who are specialized in that 
uh, area and know exactly uh, what everything means. So putting this as part of the development process, which is what we help that customer uh, to do, is an amazing productivity in, uh, thing. So instead of them like completing everything, moving it to uh, our security guys, then getting the feedback that something is wrong and having to go back and fix, this is this is a, a high cost of, of, of process, high cost of the, the rework, uh, as I tagged it before, and this is not efficient. If you can get that as soon as, as your initial code is done, then you not just improve the overall process, you made sure that security is part of the development process. And that's the best way to introduce uh, security and, and policies into the mix. Um, if you want to uh, uh, look at another perspective of security is actually roles. Who can do what? What is allowed? Uh, does anybody can drop a table? Uh, can anybody access a production? Or maybe, yes, you want to have self-service, but developers should maybe uh, ship all the way to QA and higher environments should be shipped by someone else because you want to practice also separation of duties. That's another best practice that, that you, should, you think about because if someone is doing something incorrect, either maliciously or by mistake, if another person is in, entitled to look it, into it and then decide to, to ship it, you can catch things. Just think about someone who has full credentials to the whole process and he fell uh, a victim to key logging. That person who hacked the system now has access to everything. They could issue a so-called valid, but actually malicious piece of code and deploy it all the way to production because they can. So breaking the process up and 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 making sure that uh, uh, security is thought even uh, uh, at that level can save you a lot of headache and a lot of problems. Uh, so who can create the code? What changes are valid? Uh, what should go forward? Who can get can say, yeah, go ahead, go forward? Uh, where can it run? When can it run? Maybe it's super uh, uh, efficient to create an automation that deploy all the way to production. Does it mean that you could deploy to production middle of the day? Maybe yes. Does it mean that you could maybe do specific changes middle of the day? Maybe not. So if you just think about a, a benign uh, a database actions like rebuilding an index. You're not breaking the data. You're not breaking the schema. Everything would work well after that. But if you do it middle of the day when all the transactions are running on a huge database, the application might not work for the rest of the day. Okay, Because that might be millions of rows and, and everything would start uh, stuttering and, and, and getting stuck. So all of these things are combination of process, uh, testability, policies, security, role management. And of course, if you manage to actually document everything, then you're in a good place. So re recapping uh, what I've been telling you about in this uh, session. So first of all, uh, why are we moving faster? Why are we, uh, why do we want to, to solve the problems that we solve? Because we need to, uh, deliver faster to the market. We want to uh, improve collaboration. We want to break silos. We want to make sure that we don't have inconsistencies be between environments, that we speed up things. And uh, this is all automation, okay? So automation, yes, but for the database, database specified automation tools. So there's a few in the market. You're, you're, you're probably, uh, uh, might have heard of them. The investor is definitely one of them. And if I would end this slide is with the bottom line. Uh, don't use general automation solutions for the database because it's it's like the classic uh, 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 sentence that if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Database deployments is not a nail, it's a screw. Don't, don't hit it because you would break everything. Uh, sorry. That's actually uh, double scripts, uh, uh, slides. So uh, a few words about the master before we open it up uh, uh, for questions. Um, the master is, is a DevOps for database solution. 
So we deal with end-to-end uh, -end database source control, uh, build automation. Uh, we help uh, customers create self-service for the different processes. We help with release automation, uh, with risk management, and security is a tight uh, uh, piece of, of this process, like making sure that whatever you do, you do it in a consistent way, that nobody's uh, breaking policies and, 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 and doing what they shouldn't do. And then we help you measure it all, uh, uh, and, and let me talk about that as well. So uh, source control, just taking all your database uh, changes and pushing them into your uh, Git, helping you create code automatically. Release some machine, make sure that your database releases are going from one server to the other in a consistent way, in a uh, uh, well-managed way, managed way where everything is documented and risk is part of the process while everything is being documented. Uh, we have other box, automated uh, dashboards to help you measure and improve. Actually, we work with Dora as part of uh, uh, our recent uh, collaboration uh, earlier th this year, and, and we have out-of-the-box Dora reports that uh, would uh, give you like your uh, objective uh, perspective of how your company is uh, doing versus the market. Uh, we manage risk, so to help find configuration drifts. Uh, AI will help you deal with problems and policies would make sure that you do everything as you should. So if a developer is writing a drop table and forgetting to put the where, uh, DMSO would stop that for you. If you write a drop column, uh, DMSO would stop this until someone authorizes it and you don't break your entire list of databases like deployment to dev, QA, whatever. So with that, I would like to thank you and uh, focus on the questions that you might have. Perfect. No, great presentation. Um, <clears throat> yeah, excited. We have a good number of questions in the chat. I'll um, share here. So yeah, first one is from uh, Prakash. He's asking, how big is the lead time to introduce DB Maestro, DB Maestro into an existing pipeline? The DevOps and SRE teams usually do a fair amount of testing before adding such a component. Yeah, that, that's that's a, a, a fair question. I would say not different than any DevOps solution that you would consider. Usually we've seen, uh, let, let me divide this question, this my answer into two. Uh, technical and and like process wise, organizational wise. Technical, it's very easy. You could have a, a solution installed like in, in an hour or two, depending on your like uh, constraints in your company based on uh, uh, permissions, security, who's allowed to authorize whatever, etc. So that is one thing. Like the technical aspect is easy. Uh, actually, implementing and making this part of your process could be done uh, in a simple way, like in 20, 30 hours, if you probably just want to build a, 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 a release pipeline and connect it to basic uh, releases, to always improving kind of the thing that you would probably do for your own uh, uh, DevOps process. So how much time does it take to, to be done with DevOps? You would probably never be done with it. And, 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 and your role, uh, 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 Prakash is 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 to be a DevOps person. That means that you constantly improve things, things that already work, but maybe not as well as you want, or you have other tests. So same with the master. You can always add more complexities, more ideas, more checksums, more things to prevent you from making mistakes. But the initial part is is rather simple, and starting to seeing results is 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 pretty quick. I hope I answered your questions as you intended to ask it. Perfect. Um, and yeah, another question there is, uh, can it, in oh, sorry, here we go. Can it interface with IAM, AWS, AD, or SSO for user auth authentication and authorization? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, we have, um, we have the, the latest uh, uh, support for Okta and, and, and uh, other uh, standards uh, for single sign-on, and, and that would mean that essentially all the users uh, would be uh, synced into your 
like all the, the the users that you're using would be seen into into the master into the process. So yeah. Perfect. Um, question from Shweta: How many times should it be repeated or tested for DevOps to ensure things are working and there's no errors? Um, if you keep testing, it consumes a lot of time. But how do you manage yeah. that balance? Yeah, that 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 is a good question. Uh, each company might have a different answer. I've seen. Uh, shorter pipelines where you have two, three environments. I've seen bigger ones where they have like six, seven, and eight like repetitive uh, stations to, to test things. L let me give my two cents. Uh, if you have a CI database, meaning uh, you're testing this before it goes off uh, and, and you have like before the initial release, you have some feedback. You have integration. You have QA that's the minimum before you go to production. If you have pre-production to test for performance, four or five would probably be enough for most. Some goes beyond. Three okay. would be the absolute minimum. I would not go be below three. Four is good, five is amazing. Makes sense. Um... And then, yeah, question about if it's similar to liquid base and, um, you know, what the sizable differences would be. Uh, yes, this this is not a, a like competitive uh, a comparison by any means. Uh, liquid base works. The goal is the same. So uh, similar from the endpoint perspective, yes. Uh, liquid waste works with state-based. Uh, Dmaster thinks it's not safe enough to do that. So liquid waste says there's a model, and this is the model we put on this database, that database, etc. Um, to our experience, uh, you need to be safer by having a, a, a migration-based release. So the migration is identical between different uh, releases, uh, and you use state-based only to the leftmost uh, uh, station. That's the biggest uh, uh, difference. And there's more about you know, security and st other stuff that, uh, if this is relevant for you, I'll be happy to jump on a like more detailed discussion. Perfect. Um, let's do, yeah, like, uh, looks like we could do probably do two or three more questions here. Um, so yeah, one question is, uh, from Ben, we work with Jira for everything. Can DB Maestro help with that? Uh, actually, yes. Uh, and and as part of the process, um, a lot of our customers are using Jira and Jenkins, uh, Jira and and GitHub, uh, and and a process that we suggested once, and and people seem to to love it, and we replicated to a lot of them is uh, uh, triggering. Uh, releases triggering uh, 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 CI processes based on Jira statuses. So you might look at, the, at, at your at your board and say, uh, this is ready for uh, testing and, and just dragging it would trigger some automation. And this is ready for QA and just dragging it would trigger automation. So Jira is, is a great part of that uh, process, definitely. Perfect. I think we have time for one last question. Sure. Um, from Steve, uh, based on your body of work, all the things you've seen evolving in the industry, what does the future look like, especially with emerging technologies in the DevOps field? Um, so this is a very generic, uh, like, open question. I think that looking at the DevOps, uh, DevOps industry, the thing that uh, we put a lot of emphasis on, and I see other vendors as well, is uh, going into two main, main directions. One is observability. Uh, because there's a lot of moving pieces, a lot of moving cogs, uh, understanding the big picture can become more challenging. So being able to have different dashboards, different perspectives that brings you knowledge rather than data is something that I see emerging. And on the other aspect, uh, it's, it's a bit corny to say, but AI. 
uh, AI could save a lot of work, could do repetitive things better than a person. And I think that there's a lot of things uh, in DevOps that would potentially be improved by, by AI. So introducing more safety, more repeatability, more tests and more gateways uh, that otherwise might uh, be manual or semi-manual. Perfect. And yeah, I'll take this question. Uh, getting a recording after the meeting. Actually, on this platform, if you go back in um, to the same link you joined, uh, probably within an hour, it should be in on-demand mode where you can go back and rewatch from the beginning. Uh, we'll also be posting to the Boston New Tech new, uh, YouTube channel, and we'll have um, uh, and even his team can send over any other information and follow-ups to all the participants that came out and joined us today. So, Jason, if if there is yeah. if there are additional questions that were not answered, uh, I'd be happy if you could. Uh, share that with us and we'll try to over, uh, to answer over email. Perfect. Yeah, appreciate it. No, thanks for a great presentation and thanks to the audience for um, great questions and really hope, hope uh, you all enjoyed it as much as I did and, you know, learned a lot from me and Eve and his team and um, looking forward to more of these. So thanks for coming out and thanks for sharing with us. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. אני סוגר את זה